Have you ever kept your identity secret from someone for a while just to see what they would say? Like maybe you helped out in your kid's classroom at school and there were some kids talking, like they knew your kid, but they didn't know you were the mom or the dad. And so you just listened in and those kinds of conversations are precious to overhear. I have a friend that's a cop who just loves it, like he'll go to a concert playing clothes and someone will just light up a joint right in front of him or, or talk to him about uh, uh, something illegal that they're going to do. And like, oh, unfortunately, I have to arrest you right now. What? Uh, some of you are business owners. Maybe you own a restaurant. Maybe you developed a product and, and you've been in a crowd and someone has been talking about your thing and you listened in on that. It's just really, really cool when you have the opportunity to do that. Now, listen, so... Last year, uh, the day before Easter, it was the day before Easter, right? And we went to Lowe's, and because our grill was, it was, I had, we had our grill for 14 years. I'm cheap. I'll like, you know, I'll grind that thing in the ground. And so it eventually got to the point where I had rusted out holes in the bottom of it. And I said, we're going to go to Lowe's, right? That's it. We're going to get a new grill. So we go to Lowe's, get a grill, pick it out. And I'm not the biggest handyman in the world, so I wanted to buy the pre-assembled one. We take it through the line at Lowe's. Lisa pulls the wrap around, and then as we go to put it in, I realized, oh, I should have measured this thing because it won't fit. Well, fortunately, a kid came up that worked at Lowe's, 15, 16 years old, uh, walked over and said, sir, do you need some help? And I'm thinking, oh, this is great. I'll, I'll tip him five bucks, something like that, and he can help me disassemble this thing, and we can put it in the back of our car. Well, why we do that he, this is where it was, and so he gets down on the right-hand side with a screwdriver, and he's pulling this thing apart. I get down on the left-hand side. It was a cold day, so I had a jacket on. I had my sunglasses and a hat, and so we have this conversation going on, and I said, hey, tomorrow's Easter. Are you going to church anywhere? And he said, I've got to be honest. Our family, not the church-going type, haven't been to church in years, but we just started visiting this, this church, and we love it. He said, it's called Christ Church of the Valley. Have you ever heard of it? I'm like, hmm. And I said, well, tell me about it. So he goes on and talks about how friendly the people were and the music and all the programs and the difference where this congregation is making out in the community. And so as he's talking, I said, it, 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 it actually, I've, I've heard of this place, but the only thing I know about it is that the pastor, isn't he like an ex-model or an actor or something like that? As soon, I said, isn't he like supposed to be really good looking? And so I kid you not, he's sitting on the other side. He sticks his hand up and goes, eh. <laughs> Stupid kid. Anyway, well, whether you're a mom hiding your identity from your fourth grader's friends or a business owner trying to get a sneak peek on how people actually think about your product, product it's kind of fun to play along when that happens. But for Jesus, hiding his identity was not a game. It was probably a matter of survival. When I first read the Gospel of Matthew, I could never understand why Jesus would heal someone and then turn around and say, oh, and by the way, you can't tell anybody about this. Heal someone. By the way, you can't tell anybody. Heal them. Can't tell anybody. Why would he do this? There was a German New Testament scholar by the name of William Reed. He called this phenomenon the messianic secret. This, this quest by Jesus in the Gospels to do messianic stuff, but to keep people from understanding that he was the Messiah. Like, for instance, in Matthew chapter 8, there was a guy who came to Jesus with leprosy. Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand, touched him, said, I'm willing, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy, and look at what it says. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone. Now, do you think that guy kept his mouth shut? Absolutely not. It reminds us of, uh, in our family when we got a um, trampoline. We decided we were going to get a trampoline. A kid's been begging us for a trampoline. Trampolines sometimes are popular. Other people are like weary, don't want to get hurt on it, especially you got to talk to your insurance guy. So I'm, we're, we're driving into our neighborhood, pulling up to our house, and I told the kids, we're getting a trampoline, but no one is allowed to say anything. No one is. As soon as we open up the door, my four-year-old saw her friend Liza. Hey, Liza, we're getting a trampoline, but it's a secret. Can't tell anybody. Like, great. That's great. This, so it happens again in the next chapter. Chapter 9. It says, there was a guy who came to him with his friend. They were both blind. Heard that Jesus was walking down the path. 
grabs his friend, comes over to Jesus and said, will you heal us? And it's, then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done. And their sight was restored. Then Jesus warned them sternly, see that no one knows about this. Did they keep it secret? Of course not. They went out and spread the news about him all over the region. It reminds me of these times where Jimmy Fallon will take famous musicians and they'll go into New York subways, dress them up like this particular band, dress them up like hillbillies. How long do you think it took before that subway at 42nd Street was swamped when people realized it was you too? Not long at all. Scholars debate, why did Jesus try to keep his identity a secret? Some scholars say maybe he wanted to spend as much time as possible with his disciples without the crowds pressuring in on them. Or maybe he didn't want to draw the attention of political re uh, leaders in Jerusalem. Those are probably factors, but what the Gospel of Matthew was trying to communicate is that the reason Jesus tried to keep his identity a secret was to allow his disciples as much time as possible to naturally discover who he really was. They followed him for two years and had no idea who he was because he never shared it with them. Finally, in the 16th chapter of Matthew, everything changes. In the book of Matthew, there's a before and after. And the before and after is chapter 16 of Matthew. Jesus goes and he takes his disciples on a retreat he goes up to an area called Caesarea Philippi. If you look on the map, Jesus, uh, his ministry happened mainly around the north side of the Sea of Galilee, and he went on a full, long day's hike all the way up to Caesarea Philippi. In this pagan area, it is the northernmost border of Israel. And he did that because he wanted to get away with his disciples and ask him a question. When he did that, he shared with his disciples something that blew their minds. And would we American Christians find out what he shares, it will have the same effect. Now we're continuing this series that we're calling Via Crucis, the way of the cross in Latin. And what we're doing is we're tracing Jesus' journey from Galilee to Golgotha. We're learning things that are rarely shared in church and we're talking about the, the demands that are also placed on us. And what we learned last week in Matthew chapter 12, it was the first time religious leaders wanted to kill him. Today, we're going to learn what Jesus reveals. Now, if you're new today, every single week, we always take a part of our service. We take the Bible and we open up and we ask God, what does this say to us? And there are carts with Bibles on them out there. Or if you are a visual person, you like having it on your phone, you can go to the app store, type in CCV Mobile, pull up our church app. On the right-hand side, it says Bible. You can click that, and it will look at the passage we're going to look at right now. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Son of Man was a term from the book of Daniel that Jesus loved to use about himself. Who do people say that I am? That's a legitimate question. He's never asked his disciples that question before. Nobody knew. They replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. In other words, Jesus, you're an awful lot like Elijah. There's this story in the Old Testament about Elijah grabbed a jar of oil and prayed over it, and they kept dipping the oil out, and the jar never ran dry. Can you think of a miracle that Jesus did where he prayed over some food and the food multiplied? Jesus was like Elijah. That's a good guess. Jesus was like John the Baptist. A lot of the disciples were like, listen, we've had, we've had dinner with John the Baptist. You're a lot like John the Baptist. Uh, Jeremiah, he could be like Jeremiah. Jeremiah ticked off the religious leaders. Jesus was a lot like that. But for the very first time, he looked at the disciples and said, no, 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 no. Who do you think I am? What about you, he asked, verse 15. Who do you say I am? And Peter was like, listen, I remember those dinners that we've had with John the Baptist. John the Baptist is nothing like you. You're not a prophet. Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, last week we talked about how the Jews, 180 years before Jesus, 
had the Syrian Empire come down, they're called the Seleucids, and basically wreaked havoc on the Jews. Massacred, killed them, did terrible things to them. But there was a guy who raised up called Judah Maccabee, Judah the Hammer, who led raids and liberated the Jewish people from the Greeks who were coming down. And now, 180 years later, the Greeks are no longer there, but the Romans have taken their place. Now listen to this. Please understand this. A Messiah was not the third person of the Trinity, the Son of God. We read that into the text. The Messiah was a warrior anointed by God to deliver God's people from their enemies. That's what a Messiah was. A Messiah was a, just an unbelievable Navy SEAL who was a general. That's it. Samson was a Messiah. King David was the ultimate Messiah. Judah the Hammer was a Messiah. And so when Peter said that Jesus was the Messiah, he believed that Jesus was going to lead with God's help in a surgency to get rid of the Romans. Doing miracles and saying wise words were simply confirmation that God was with Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, to liberate them from the Romans. Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, you didn't come up with this on your own. God revealed this to you. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Here's my question I want to ask every person in this room. Who do you think Jesus was? Was he just a man like Peter thought? Who is Jesus to you? Matthew tells us after Peter said this, Jesus ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Again, he kept it up. Now at this point, people in the 21st century, American Christians love a warrior Jesus. We American Christians love a Jesus, Jesus that is a Messiah that loves America before all other countries and wants our God to use our American might to bomb the world into submission. That's the kind of Messiah we want. We want a Judah the hammer. We like that Jesus. We, don't want, a, we want a blow him up Messiah. But in the next verse, Jesus tells Peter and the disciples that this word Messiah, in the words of the 20th century theologian, and Nigo Matoya, you keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> Jesus said this, this Messiah thing? I just told you what my identity is. I'm the Messiah. I need to tell you now what my mission is. And so from that time on, verse 21 says, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. And suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And Peter was like, that is a terrible Messiah. A Messiah that gets killed? We're, we're already losing to Rome. We don't need a loser. We need someone that's just a winner that's going to come and help us win. He says, tell me, Jesus, what great men and women of the Bible died as martyrs? Let me ask you this question. Think, in the Old Testament, what great man or woman of God died as a martyr? If you die as a martyr, that means you're a loser. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, they all died natural deaths. None of them died as martyrs. Moses died an old man. David and Solomon died natural deaths. Esther was willing to be a martyr, didn't die. Daniel was willing to be a martyr, didn't die. Why? Because they're winners. None of them died. Peter's like, you're going to die. You're the worst Messiah ever. Besides, you're my friend. I'm not going to let you die. We've become close the last two years. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. And then something happens. Notice this. One minute earlier, Jesus said that Peter was speaking words that were inspired by God. Now, Jesus said that Peter is speaking words that are inspired by Satan. Jesus turned to him and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely 
human concerns. Jesus says, I'm the Messiah. This is my mission. I'm going to die. You don't like it. You want a kingdom without the cross. This week, uh, not this week, uh, another day, I was in a hurry to get somewhere, and so I jumped on 422. It was the middle of the day, so I thought I was safe, right? And now, if you, you and I both know, if you get on 422 between 715 and 815 a.m., you need a new therapist, right? But this was the middle of the day. I thought I was safe, so I hop on, I floor it, and I'm speeding down 422, and I pull up on a guy who was in the left-hand lane going 52 miles an hour. Now, the Bible tells us there is a special place in hell <laughs> reserved for murderers, terrorists, and people who drive 52 in the left-hand lane of 422. As I pulled up on this guy, I thought, oh, well, surely he's just going to go ahead and move over to the right. Nothing happened. So I, I flipped my high beams on. Nothing. I then I flipped him on a lot, didn't budge at all. And so I leaned forward and gave him what usually works. <laughs> that didn't work either. So pressed for time, I whipped it over in the right-hand lane, sped up, got beside him and went. And then I realized, oh, this person attends CCV. Hi, I just wanted to say hello. I just wanted to, wanted to say hello. The spiritual writer Watchman Nee said, I want deliverance. I need forgiveness for what I've done, but I need also deliverance from what I am. And Jesus knew that God's people had already tried the make the world better through politics approach. What needed to happen was not to remove political enemies, but to change people's hearts, change my innate deeply seated ongoing struggle with patience to change your struggle with envy to change our struggle with greed hatred lust affairs addiction lying sloth rage the world thought what it needed was a political revolution and it still does we're going to fix this world through politics but what God knew what it really needed was a revolution of the heart, an inner transformation. And so in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus reveals his identity, he reveals his mission, and then he reveals our mission. He was the dying Messiah, and anyone that wanted to follow him needed to be willing to become dying disciples. Are you? Verse 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever wants to lose their life in death for me, Jesus said, literally, if you die for me, you will find your life. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And to anyone who are here, Jesus is looking at you, and he's like, listen, I get you. Think it's not going to be fair. I'm just simply going to tell that if you die for me, the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. If you have died for Jesus, he will reward you for doing that. Does everybody get what Jesus is saying here? Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, when Christ calls a man, he bids him, come and die. Let me ask you again, what kind of Jesus do you think you're following? The Jesus of the Bible, the real Jesus, started a movement of sacrificial love. And people who are willing to sacrifice their lives can join him in this movement. That involves sacrifice and suffering. No doubt this blew Peter's mind. But after the resurrection, he got it. We know this because Peter shot off a letter to a group of disciples of Jesus who were suffering. And he wrote this. Look at what Peter said. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you 
as though something strange were happening to you. As if this is a surprise. Jesus made it very clear that people who are going to be, their disciples, be his disciples must be willing to pick up a cross and die. Literally. And so let me ask you, are you willing to pick up that cross? Are you willing to follow Jesus when he doesn't answer your prayers? When he doesn't answer your prayer to make you comfortable, to heal you, to give you a raise, to resolve that conflict peacefully, to take away the pain that you feel right now, to make things right, to make everything better. The reason we're doing this series called Via Crucis is it's easy to follow the Messiah that we make up in our minds. It's difficult to follow the real Jesus, and we have to understand the difference. Listen to this. We are disciples of the crucified God, not a self-help thought leader selling feel-good tricks on how to live our best life right now. The dying Messiah is the only Jesus that's worth following. This is the only kind of discipleship that has ever truly changed a person and changed the world. Which explains why, after revealing who he actually was, it says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. They're like, got to be honest, like, we like the food. We like the fact that you'll heal us. But this whole death thing, I signed up for you to make my life better, not to make it worse. And so everyone went away, except the 12. And Jesus looked at the 12 and he said, you do not want to leave too, do you? And then Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Let's pray. God, it's so easy to follow this Jesus in our mind who basically agrees with everything that we do, every decision that we make, and wants to simply take away all pain. But then we read, you're not interested in that. That you have a mission that you're asking us to join and that you have really no interest in joining our mission, our plan, our bucket list, the way that we want our lives to work and make sense and be perfect. Help every person in this room this morning. Every person in their heart have an encounter with the real you, the real dying, crucified Messiah. And let us reaffirm again if we're actually willing to be your disciples. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.